So here, and this is what everybody listening can do. You set it up for everybody. You know, this is part of your healing process is then, you know, you're reframing it. You're giving it the names that you want to. You're setting it up the way that you want them to understand. And that helps them to know how they can better support you uh, moving forward. And I, I love that you did that because that's a very proactive approach, right? Welcome to Motherhood 2.0, where we're taking motherhood to the next level. I'm Dr. Christina Hibbert, your host, clinical psychologist, speaker, author, and oh yeah, mom of six and mother of the year for Arizona, here to help you overcome, to become, and yes, to flourish as we grow through motherhood together instead of just going through it to do on our own. Be sure to visit my website, drchristinahibbert.com, as well as join our Facebook group, Motherhood 2.0. All right, everybody, let's get growing. All right, so we are excited for our guest today as we talk about this really important topic on miscarriages and how do we deal with perinatal loss and what are some things that can be helpful and what are some things that we might not want to say or do that might harm and and not be helpful for others. We've got a fabulous guest today. Dr. Katie Huey Harrison is here. Katie, welcome to Motherhood (laughs) 2.0. So glad to have you here. And before we start talking, I'm going to tell everybody just a little bit about you to get us started. So um, Dr. Katie Huey Harrison, she is a writer and a blogger and a former academic, and she is a mom of one son and four angel babies. She runs Undefining Motherhood, which is an activism blog that works to dispel the myths that there are specific ways to be, quote, good or, quote, bad mothers. One of her main goals, as her blog title shows, is to shift our cultural understanding of who qualifies as a mother. And for Katie, motherhood is a product of the heart, not the legal system, the lab, or the womb. I love this. And how are, how was the best way for people to get in touch with you if they wanted to contact you, Katie? Um, there is a contact page on my website. They can also reach me at Katie, K-A-T-Y, at undefiningmotherhood.com. Okay, so undefiningmotherhood.com or Katie, K-A-T-Y, that's right, at undefiningmotherhood.com. Yes. Awesome. All right, well, let's just jump in. I mean, you... I I was just doing a webinar today talking about how we end up becoming experts in things we never want to or intend to, but this is something you know know a lot about because you've had a lot of personal experience. So just to start us off, I wanted to know if you'd tell us a little bit about your experience with all of the loss in your life, and we'll go from there and and share some of the things that you've learned along the way. Sure. Um, So this all began, um, oh, it was many probably four or five years ago at this point. Um, My husband and I decided we wanted to have a baby. And very cutely, I thought, okay, I'm going to work this in perfectly to my career and to my plans. Um, So we're going to get pregnant between the months of July and September. And that's going to mean that I can finish an academic school year, have a baby, at the beginning of the summer and then still go back to work teaching classes writing my doctoral dissertation Mm. during that same time yeah (laughs) fast forward a year and a half we don't have a baby or so much as a positive pregnancy test yet Mm. um so at that point i was sitting on my couch one night writing out a list, as I tend to do, of things that I needed to ask my gynecologist at my annual appointment the next day about fertility testing. When all of a sudden, I get this sharp pain in my left breast, and it occurs to me that I've been nauseous all weekend long, and that I've had food cravings and aversions, and perhaps I should take a pregnancy test. Um, And so literally planning to ask about fertility testing the very next day, I found out that I was pregnant. Mm. Um, Went to my doctor, extremely excited. She confirmed the pregnancy. Um, Everything looked really good until one day I went in for an ultrasound and it didn't look really good anymore. Mm. I really was not prepared for the emotional toll of that experience. Uh, You know, we're misled. I have learned to believe that our mother's experiences in terms of reproductivity will likely 
mimic our own. And that's just not true. Um, and it certainly was not true for me. Um, I ended up having another miscarriage followed by an ectopic pregnancy. Mm -hmm. um, I was referred out to a fertility specialist who is one of my true saving graces in life. And his wife was my gynecologist. I'm abundantly thankful for these two doctors and everything that they did for me together. Uh, and then we thought we had figured out the problem. Uh, he did an endometrial biopsy and he found inflammation in my uterus and um, he put me on a strong regimen of antibiotics. My husband and I started doing Whole30, which was an anti-inflammatory diet. We got rid of the inflammation. We tried again, and that one didn't work either. Mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. so that began an even longer journey of testing. And it's such an invasive process um, that I found that externalizing it and talking about it and writing about it were some of the ways that I was able to really cope and deal with everything that was happening inside my body by sort of placing it outside my body. Uh, we did another procedure um, where he actually did discover the problem and I, I sort of was patient zero, which was really cool. Um, it was any other doctor on any other day at any other time had lunch been sooner, had he been hungry, um, he might not have done this one small thing that he did and I probably never would have had a biological child. Um, but he did, he decided during his steroscopy that he was going to reshape my uterus that was just ever so slightly misshapen. And so he decided to make it my uterus a very proper, perfect shape. And when he started doing that, he discovered that my uterine wall that was being kind of shaved away, sorry, queasy listeners, um, <laughs> didn't bleed. Mm. And that was shocking to him. Um, and we discovered that 70% of my uterine wall was dead tissue. Mm. And so I had all of these embryos that were implanting properly. Um, once I was able to get pregnant, it was like I couldn't stop getting pregnant. I was pregnant every time I turned around. But they weren't able to get the blood flow that they needed to grow. And mm. he sent me home to recover with some medication and told me to wait six weeks and 10 weeks later, I was pregnant with this funky little 15 month old we now know is Jack. Wow. Um, it's really amazing. Gosh, what an experience you guys had to go through to get your little Jack. And I'm so happy for you. I've got tears. Oh. <laughs> and you know, so I mean, you're a perfect example of <clears throat> I mean, your doctorate isn't in you know, medicine or something like that. But, you know, you do, you, you, you do have this experience. And like I say, it's the doctor of life degree and that's the one that counts, yes. right? Absolutely. <laughs> so you know what it's like going through this experience. And we, I know we have many, many listeners that are going to hear this and they've been through this or they will go through this, whether they, you know, know it or not yet. And we both know that there are some things that people some ways that people respond <laughs> and things that people say <laughs> that are really not helpful. So I want to start with that aspect. Like, okay, how do we help others? Like if I'm your friend and this is what you're going through, how can I help you? And how do I know what not to say? And then maybe what to say? And then how do we help ourselves as well? So that's kind of what I want to focus on. So let's start with some of the things that you want to tell people do not say or do this because it's really not going to help. <laughs> there is such a long list. Um, I actually have a post about this on Undefining Motherhood, um, and it's also going to be coming out on Scary Mommy on October 23rd, and so people can find it there as well. Yeah. Um, that post is eight things not to say to someone experiencing miscarriage. Um, there are so many more than eight things, but in the world we live in, people love those numerical headlines. Yes. Uh, the main things that I think I really want people to understand not to say are anything that minimizes the situation. Uh, I have a friend whose story about her miscarriages I actually am sharing on Undefining Motherhood today. So by the time this podcast is out, it will be an old post already. Awesome. Um, and she said when she sent me her story, I just don't feel like 
I really deserve to get to tell my story the way that someone like you might, because it really wasn't that bad in comparison. Mm -hmm. Um, But when you're going through it, it's hell. Mm -hmm. And it's such an, an awful experience emotionally and physically. And so when people say things that minimize that experience, it's exceedingly hurtful. And what I mean when I say minimize is things like anything that begins with the word at least. Mm. Please, please do not say to me, at least you weren't further along. At least you know you can have children or a that would be a terrible one because I didn't have children at the point, but I heard so many times, at least, you know, you can get pregnant. Yes. And it's actually possible that getting pregnant, if you get pregnant too easily, which once we started to, we kind of did, that can be a a problem that can cause miscarriage. It can be that your body is willing to accept embryos that are not compatible with life. And so you become pregnant and then your body recognizes that and it miscarries. That was not my particular issue, Mm -hmm. but that does happen. And so people are saying these things meaning well, trying to make you feel better. Um, And instead what they're doing is they're reminding you of the distance between what you're experiencing and what they understand. Mm. Um, And miscarriage is a very isolating experience. You need to feel closer to people. You need to feel connected with people and like you have a community of support. Um, And so when people say things that make you feel like you should be over it or you shouldn't feel like it's as big a deal, that's really difficult. I want to emphasize this because I think this is a really important point. Like you said, it it kind of distances you from or it makes you feel... I mean, also what I'm hearing you say is that it also makes you feel like you shouldn't feel like you do. You know what I mean? Like Absolutely. Pe- when people say that, they are minimi- they are minimizing and they are making it seem like it's not as big of a deal as as it should be. Or even like you were just saying, like even for those of you out there who have experienced even one miscarriage or, or infant loss in any way, shape or form, um, don't compare to other people because you're right. It's so easy. I, I mean, I've done that even with like death and loss, like, well, it's probably not as sad for me as it was for so-and-so, but it's not, it's not a comparison kind of thing. Like you said, it's hard for everybody and we can't minimize because I think what you said is so important. It, it, it puts that distance between, not only between you and the person, obviously, <laughs> but it's trying to put distance between you and the situation, which really needs to be grieved and dealt with and not just exactly. forgotten, right? Exactly. I feel like I'll, one thing that a lot of people do with their responses in moments like this is they don't know how to grieve and deal with it. And so they say something that is really making them as a speaker feel better. Yeah. Um, And we don't recognize when we do that, that what that often is doing is making the listener feel worse. When you're going through grief, everything is about that grief and that person grieving. And it's hard to understand that everyone else's world is still turning around them and yours feels like it's standing still. And so I think it's very important for people to recognize in these moments, if someone is in the most negative possible mindset, how could they interpret what Mm. I'm going to say? Mm. And Imagine that that's how they will interpret it and rephrase accordingly. I know one instance of that, and this is, you know, another sort of, in a way, a minimizing experience to me, um, is when people bring in sort of ethical or philosophical or religious doctrines and they say things like, well, this just wasn't meant to be, this just wasn't God's will, Mm -hmm. Uh, whatever it is that they say those things can be extremely painful when you're going through it. Um, And one that was interesting to me, and I think taught me a lot about paying attention to how someone might interpret something that you wouldn't envision, um, is when people said, pray about it. Hmm. Um, Because what they thought they were doing was giving me a place to turn, was saying, here is something that you can turn to for comfort and it's going to help you. And what I heard in that moment was, you clearly haven't prayed hard enough. Mm. If only you had prayed harder, 
you might not be going through this. Um, I also heard people say a lot of times around this time, and they've probably always done this, but I never noticed before. They would say things like, oh yeah, I'm so glad that my daughter, you know, has this healthy body or whatever it is that someone has. I prayed really hard about that. Mm -hmm. And all they were doing was talking. But what I heard was blame. Yeah. And if only you had done your part better, you wouldn't be in this situation, which no one ever intended. And I knew that. But I, we do need to understand the mindset that any griever is living in is not the mindset that the rest of the world is in at that moment. And yeah. we take things our own way. Yeah, that's so important and I really appreciate how you put that and you know, giving it the bigger context and helping others understand. I know everybody listening, I know you've all, whether you've been through this personally or not, we all know somebody or have a friend who's been through this. And it does remind me totally of any kind of loss or death and just how awkward people are in what they say and just ugh, try not to say the trite things that you, <laughs> it is because you're awkward and you don't know what to say. And I, honestly, as I always say, like, and as we kind of transition into what to do or what to say, um, I always tell people like, you know, just say that you don't know what to say, you know, say, I'm Absolutely. so sorry. And I don't know what to say, you know, I just, Absolutely. right. So it's what, thoughts. what are some things that, yeah, this sucks. So what are some things that are helpful to say or do to help somebody else who's just experienced a loss like this? Yeah. I mean, I think what you just said is one of the big ones is I'm sorry. There's nothing I can do. There's nothing I can say. This sucks, but I'll sit with you through it. Mm -hmm. um, I'll sit with you through the suckiness. If you need to vent, if you need to cry, if you need to talk, if you need me to leave you alone because you want to be a complete hermit for a couple of weeks, I'm here for whatever you need me to do. Yeah. Um, and what that does, and this is, I think, the, the real key of what to do to help people, is it validates mm -hmm. the experience. It validates the grief. It says you deserve to feel the way you feel right now. Yeah. And so however that makes me feel, however uncomfortable or comfortable or difficult or easy that makes my life, that's okay. Okay because you deserve to feel the way that you feel. Validate, validate, validate. Um, I had a friend once, and it's so funny because people cringe when I tell this story because they think what she said was so awful. And to me, it was the best thing she could have said. Um, I had just gone through my third miscarriage. She was pregnant with a baby who was due about a week after that baby would have been. Mm. Um, and at about, I think she was maybe nine or 10 weeks pregnant. And she said, I don't know if it's appropriate to ask you this or not. And I appreciated that preface that helped to make it more appropriate. Mm -hmm. um, she said, I'm having this pain in my stomach. And she pointed and she described it. And she said, is that normal? And I said, yes, it's normal. Your body is producing more relaxin um, so that your muscles can expand and your uterus can expand, your bones and joints can expand for this baby. And so what you're feeling is, is stretching. It sounds like early round ligament pain. That's completely normal. It's not something to worry about. Mm -hmm. And then I kind of paused and I said, hey, what, why did you ask me that? Like you knew it might make me uncomfortable and you prefaced it that way and it didn't. I'm glad you asked, but why did you ask me? And she looked at me like it was so obvious. And she said, you know the first trimester of pregnancy better than anyone I know. Mm. Why wouldn't I ask you? Oh. And that to me, I mean, it, it was honestly kind of life changing at that moment. It was the first time I felt like someone really understood. She also was the one who asked, hey, these people are throwing me a shower. Would you like to be invited? I don't want you to feel excluded. I don't want you to have to see an invitation that's upsetting. And I mm. said, no, please do not invite me. Yeah. I gave her a gift card to a baby store that I bought at Kroger and it didn't even have a card with it. And I said, this is all I can do. Please no, it's not personal. And she did. And being able to develop that kind of rapport with someone, what that actually made happen was that her little boy, Logan, is the only child born around the child that 
the age that my first ones would be where I never looked at him and thought I, I could have one who's doing what you're doing. Mine mm -hmm. would have just started this thing that you were saying. You don't want when you're in this place to be saddened by other children, but often you are. Yeah. Um, and that's really hard. And having someone validate the experience that much yeah. for me personally, it took that element of jealousy away. Yeah. And that's huge. And I think it's a really great lesson into what we can try to offer one another. Mm. Um, the considerateness, the recognizing, hey, let me ask this person what's appropriate. Is it appropriate for me to invite you to this thing? Is it appropriate for me to ask you about this pain that I I'm love having? That. It's acknowledging and it's validating. And that, I think, is what we're lacking, not just when talking about miscarriage, but grief in general. Absolutely. Um, that's really what we're missing and what we need. So well said, I have to say, and, and you bring up so many good points here that for everybody listening, you know, when you are trying to support somebody, like you're saying, one of the first and foremost things is just to acknowledge and validate what's real and what's really happened and what's actually going on and not to minimize. And sometimes that is saying, I have no idea what to say or do, or, you know, and sometimes that is saying, you know, is it okay if I ask you this or is it okay? I love that your friend did that. That's wonderful. Yeah, it's amazing. And like, and the other part that you brought up that I wanted to emphasize is just how important it is for everybody when you're supporting someone, like you said, through any kind of loss, especially through a miscarriage and, and you know, perinatal loss, to remember that it's not, it's not you. It's not like, again, to not be offended by that, that, that you don't right. want to go to the baby shower or, you know, I've had so I have not been through um, perinatal loss myself and I've had so many friends who have and I just remember talking with them at length about it and just how hard it was for yeah for them to see others pregnant to go to even to go to like something like church or to you know a school event or something and see or have to be around that so you know we just need to have more empathy and and try to understand um, your friend maybe that's going through this and I love how your friend did that and that she didn't take it personally you know, Absolutely. so we have to be careful of that. Now, I mean, the rest of our time here, which is short still, there's so much more we could say about all this. I really want to talk about how how to help those who are going through this or will be going through this in the future, um, what they can do. And this is also for all of you who are support people. It's good for you to know, too, so that you can help. Maybe you could, you know, give some ideas for um, your friend or your family member who might be going through this on what, what is helpful and what kind of helps to process this great loss. And of course, you know, this is one of my specialty areas, loss and grief. And so I'm a big believer that you have to process this, yes. otherwise it doesn't go away. But what what have, what would you suggest or what have you found helpful through your experiences as far as dealing with it yourself and healing from these losses? For me, a huge part of it has been talking about it and writing about it openly. Yeah. Um, I know that's not right for everyone. That's not authentic to everyone. Um, but I feel like a lot of our problems come from the fact that we feel like we're supposed to be silent yes. about these things. Um, and so, for instance, you mentioned the difficulty of going to church for some people after a miscarriage. Um, one reason that I remember avoiding church is particularly Mother's Day. Mm, yeah, it's common practice, at least in the area where I live, for churches to say mothers stand up mm. so that you can be honored. Yeah. And if you haven't birthed that living child yet, what do you do? Um, and what I would love to see is the people who were saying that say, and if you are a mother in any form, if you are a mother through adoption, a stepmother, a mother to babies in heaven, yeah. you are trying desperately to be a mother, but you haven't gotten there and you're a mother at heart, stand up because you deserve to be honored on this day. Yeah. Um, and so to me, that sort of inclusiveness and recognizing that not all of our paths are the same. Um, that's what's so important. You know, I used to worry that I was going to upset people who were having struggles with fertility because I got pregnant at the drop of a hat once we made it work the first time. Right. And so even though 
our ends were the same. We still didn't have a baby. I was able to do this thing that they wanted to do. Um, so for me, that's, you know, that's a really big thing is being open and honest with people about what's going on um, to the extent that you're comfortable. And then if you're someone who is around the person going through the loss, don't be afraid to ask them about it. Don't yeah. feel like you're going to remind them they haven't stopped thinking about it. They're always thinking about it. Um, if they were far enough along that the baby had a name, use the baby's name. Yeah. If the baby had a sex that they knew, even if it was they lost the baby at six weeks, but they had a DNC and so they were able to have the tissue tested they find out what sex that baby was going to be use mm. the pronoun because it feels more personal to that parent yeah. who was imagining the life of this child um i think those are some really important things that we can do to support people um and just remember to give them what works for them um i turned very I think people saw me as being very pessimistic and very cold when it came to going through pregnancy during this process. But for me, it was not, it was neither of those things. It was actually the process that I found that worked was a step by step. Here is my next step. Here's yeah. the thing that I need to get through. And once that step has happened, I can move forward to the next one, but not, I can't think a day ahead, a week ahead, two weeks ahead, nine months ahead, because I'm not confident enough of where I'm going to land. Um, some some listeners may not be able to relate to this analogy, but pregnancy after miscarriage is exceedingly difficult. Um, yeah. And so the analogy that I gave my family as a Southerner was football. Mm. We <laughs> love football. Oh, yeah. Um, and every time I got pregnant, someone would say, this time it's going to be different. And I would say, please don't tell me that because mm -hmm. you just don't know mm -hmm. that it's going to be different. And I don't know if it's going to be different. So that positive pregnancy test for me was a really good play mm -hmm. that was necessary. But it doesn't get us there. And then if hormone levels are rising properly, that's great. Those are great plays. And if I see a heartbeat on an ultrasound, every heartbeat that I see is a first down. Yeah. But we're not in the end zone until that baby's here. That's right. And that, you know, if you're not a sports fan, maybe doesn't do you much good. But for me and for the people in my life, that was an extremely helpful. I mean, my mom would come to me during my pregnancy and she would say, how was your doctor's appointment today? And I would tell her how it went. And she would say, okay, so what kind of play was this? Oh, I love that. And it, it helped us connect because we, we grieve differently. She wanted to be pessimistic and everything's okay. And I couldn't do that. And so finding that language where you can work with the people around you, where they are, um, it, it's so huge and it's hard and it won't work with everyone. But I think putting in the energy and the effort to try, particularly if you're the person who is not in the immediate moments of grief but even if you are yeah that's really gonna help you long term ah that is such a great idea i love that analogy and i love that you what you did so here and this is what everybody listening can do you set it up for everybody you know this is part of your healing process is then you know you're reframing it you're giving it the names that you want to you're setting it up the way that you want them to understand and that helps them to know how they can better support you uh, moving forward. And I, I love that you did that because that's a very proactive approach, right? And like you said, maybe that exact analogy isn't going to work for everybody, but but I'm, I'm, I encourage everybody listening, you know, if you need to do that or you want to get an analogy, think of something that works for you, like you said, and, and teach. I mean, you're basically teaching people how to treat you, right? Yes. And that's a good thing to do, especially when you're Absolutely. going through this. The other well, part, you know, I think go one ahead. thing, sorry, I don't want to No, please go ahead. Um, one thing that I think is huge about that, too, um, and I'm sure this is something you've thought a lot about, um, given your own history and pedigree, is 
when you're going through grief, one thing that you're coming to terms with, it's a sort of reckoning and how little control you actually have. Mm -hmm. We go through life planning and making lists and trying to control things. And if you were like me, then you, you're really trying to control things. And so these moments of extreme grief are just these reminders of how little control we actually have and learning to live without it. And so I think it's important to find those small things like creating those conversations, creating the terminology that I want people to use with me is a way of taking back control in the little ways that you can and then helping you deal with the fact that you just can't yeah. in so many other ways. So, 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 so true. And you're so right because you're in a situation where you have no control and these are the ways that you can gain some of that. And so I love that, you know, be proactive, everybody out there. And I would say too, I know you, you mentioned this and I wanted to kind of emphasize and add a little to that you know, the grief process and how that's so unique for everybody. And everybody's going to go through it differently. Uh, one of my friends who lost a baby, her son was born and died a few hours later. I mean, she still talks about him and, and names him as one of her children, which of course is great, but she really moved on quickly. Like she accepted it. It didn't, it wasn't like a super awful experience for her. She somehow was able to sort of see that this was meant to be. And so for her, that was that. Then I have, you know, my other, another friend of mine who say lost a baby late, late in her pregnancy and had to go through the birth process, delivery and all of that. And, um, I mean, she still just really, really has the hardest time. And I don't know that she's actually fully gone through the grief process or let herself, you know, Yes. So I, I think everybody's so different in how we grieve and how we respond. But what you've said and, and what I'm adding, you know, emphasizing too is you have to grieve. You know, that, that's as a specialist in grief and loss, that's like the biggest question I get is, you know, how do I grieve? And I'm like, well, you just, you let yourself do it first and foremost. You let yourself feel what you need to feel and go through the emotions and be angry and be upset and be yes. negative if you need to for a while, knowing that, once you process and get through that, you can get to the other side and then you can feel that relief. And maybe even that needs to happen for some people before they can get to that place where you feel that empowerment to set things up right for you for the next go. Because I know that's a, gosh, one of the hardest things about this is that you, you get your hopes up and then you dash. I mean, it's just that constant grief. Yes. And also I want to say that a lot of times for, for women who have experienced infertility and do get pregnant and do have children later, it's actually a risk factor for postpartum depression. And you would think it wouldn't be because you'd think you're so happy, but that's the problem. It's the pressure of, you know, you finally have this child that you've worked so hard, but also you have all those losses before that probably you didn't even have time to really cope with and deal with, right? Uh, well, yeah, and I actually, I had severe postpartum anxiety, mm -hmm. um, and I did have postpartum depression, um, I believe. I was so, the anxiety was so severe that I barely even noticed the depression because there wasn't space for it. Yeah. Um, but, you know, one thing that I remember is I ended up having preeclampsia, and so I was induced at 36 weeks and six days because my high risk specialist said this baby will be born the day he is full term. And I said, can we wait, you know, trying to control things. Can we wait just one more day so I can get things in order? And she said, Nope. Sunday oh night, gosh. check into the hospital. Um, mm. And so my husband and I went to dinner before we checked into the hospital. And of course I couldn't eat anything because I was a nervous wreck. Um, and I kept using the word if mm. when I talked about, Jack. Mm -hmm. And I said, if we get to bring Jack home, we're going to, how are we going to handle nighttime schedule? Who gets up when? If we get to bring Jack home, are there any things we've forgotten that we need? We should make a list and order them from Amazon once he's born and we know that we're actually going to need them. And the, the hospital where I gave birth is actually, um, we call it the baby factory here in Atlanta. Mm. Um, they deliver more babies than anywhere in, I believe, the world wow. on a daily basis. Um, and so, you know, at one point, John just looked at me and he said, Katie, you pick this hospital for a reason. And it's because they have dealt with everything. It's, it's time to stop saying if, mm. 
you, we, this is our baby. He's fine. You're fine. We're being delivered. He's coming early to keep everyone healthy and safe. And you are in the best care you could possibly be in. Mm -hmm. And I still checked into the hospital, not believing I was coming home with a baby. And so the paradigm shift, when you do come home with a baby and all of a sudden you're sleep deprived and you're still wired to believe that everything must go wrong. Hmm. It was not a joyful time. Hmm. And then exactly as you said, there's the guilt that comes with that. The, oh, but I worked so hard. I should be happy. So many women I know are still trying to get here. I should be happy. And just like grieving, I think we have to remember the same point that you made just a little while ago is we all do it differently and we all go through it differently. And motherhood is hard and it's individual. And that's a huge part of my mission in general and helping people sort of wrap their heads around and learn to cope with. It's hard. And so, yeah, if you have a history of infertility or miscarriage, um, you likely are going to be more anxious Absolutely. after the baby is born. And that's normal and that's okay. I think what matters is knowing in those moments what is acceptable and normal to you and what is not. Yeah. Um, I was sleeping an average of five minutes at a time, three mm. times a day. So 15 minutes, nine consecutive a day. And mm. I would wake up having a massive panic attack every single time of course. that I fell asleep. And people kept saying, oh, all of you moms are anxious. It's yeah. fine. And I said, no, this is not fine. Mm -hmm. This is a serious problem. Yeah. Um, but I, I knew that because I knew myself and I have access to excellent mental health care. Yay. Um, and thank God for it. Um, and so I think that's something we really need to know in process. You're right, is that our own versions of grief and our own versions of fine are not the same. Yeah. Um, and what other people think and what other people tell us, um, I saw a, a great quote, um, look up Mindy from Pappy on social media, um, because she wrote a really great blog the other day um, that was based on a quote um, that said something to the effect of when you're trying to make, when you're trying to please everyone else, all you're actually doing is making everyone like you but yourself. Oh um, gosh, that's good. I, like, I know, right? And it's, it's one of those ouch kind of things. Um, it's on my Instagram feed. I borrowed it from her and I, you know, read it, forwarded it from her feed. But it's also one of those things that I think is so important in these moments when you're listening to everyone else about what you should be feeling and how you should be feeling, you're making yourself feel worse. You're not allowing yourself to understand how you actually feel. Absolutely. Um, and that's, that's a really important thing. The, my struggles with miscarriage don't mean it's going to be as hard on other people as it was on me. And it also doesn't mean that it won't be harder. Right. And that's, I think that's what we really need to always understand about ourselves and others. Well, well said. And I echo that. And, and for everybody listening, you know, I appreciate all your points, Katie. You really truly are an expert on this. <laughs> you know, a lot of, you have a lot of great things to say. I know it's going to be very helpful for our listeners. And for those of you who are struggling and going through any kind of loss or grief, you know, I just, you know, you mentioned, Katie, that you had excellent mental health care. And of course, I'm biased, but I know from personal experience as well um, that reaching out for that kind of help and finding people who are trained in, in helping with grief and loss and with especially with perinatal loss, and with postpartum anxiety, depression, whatever might come after, if that comes. And I didn't say that to like scare anybody, but to just be like, okay, I think you're right. I think it's good for us to know this could happen. And if it happens, okay, then I deal with that. And at least like you said, knowing yourself and knowing this isn't normal or this isn't healthy for me, um, that can sometimes be the way that we do reach out for the kind of help that we need. And that help can be really, really valuable. So I even think that knowing that it could happen to you could be part of what keeps it from happening. 
Um, yeah. Knowing that, hey, you could come home and you could be miserable with guilt and exhaustion might be what makes you say, hey, yeah, I am exhausted and this is hard, but I don't have to feel guilty about that because I already knew that might eat, it, it might not, but it might be the thing that saves you from it as well. Absolutely. So I hope everybody will check out your blog undefiningmotherhood.com for lots of, to connect with Katie and also on social media on Instagram and your Facebook. I'm guessing you're kind of all over. You're also I'm working on a book that's not ready yes. yet, but you're working on a book on this topic too. So I am, I am. I'm working on a book um, that's about, it's a, a memoir about my process of going through miscarriage, but it's actually about what we have just been talking about at the end here. Really the, the goal of the book is to look at the process that I went through and talk about how someone who has high levels of anxiety and very, very strong needs for control learns to cope with these uncontrollable situations. Mm. So go to Undefining Motherhood, connect with Katie here, there, and um, follow her so that you can, uh, we'll have you back, of course, when your book comes out, which yes. we'll be excited about. Um, but in the meantime, connect with her there, get resources. You can also visit Postpartum Support International for resources on, you know, finding providers in your area that are trained in perinatal mental health. And that includes most of the time, most of us providers that specialize in that are also very well trained in perinatal loss because it's such a huge part of the process. Um, so if you need help that way, you can check that out. Also go to my website, drchristinahibber.com for some resources, um, posts and um, articles and things that can help you there. And I have a whole series on dealing with grief. So if you're still wondering, but how do I grieve? Go there, check it out. Uh, we, I wish we had time to get into that more, but um, you can go do that. And we will be talking about this, you know, more in the future. So I really appreciate you being here, Dr. Katie. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. This has been wonderful. It's been so great to have you. And for everybody else out there, continue to come back and join us here on Motherhood 2.0, where we are not just even growing through motherhood, which is awesome enough, but we are doing it together and we're taking motherhood to the next level. And I can't wait to do that with you each week here. And we'll see you next time. Bye, everybody. Bye.